Hi, and welcome to Journey Forward with Jory Rose, where you will gain insights, tools, and inspiration to get unstuck and live your best life. Jory is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a passion for helping people cultivate awareness and authenticity so they can show up fully in all aspects of their life. And now, here's Jory. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Journey Forward with Jory Rose. This is the Mother's Day edition. For all you mamas out there, I hope that you had a beautiful Mother's Day in whichever which way that feels good to you. Sometimes Mother's Day is all about being with your kids and enjoying your family. And sometimes Mother's Day is about being by yourself and honoring self-care and having alone time. So whatever Mother's Day looked like for you, I hope it was something that felt in alignment with your needs, with your soul, with your heart, and it felt fulfilling. And for those of you who did not have that experience of motherhood of on Mother's Day, in which it maybe felt chaotic, overwhelming, stressful, full of pressure, not relaxing, I honor and hold space for just how fucking hard it is to be a mom. Right. Even with uh, difficult relationships, with healthy relationships, with expectations not being met, with ideals of how we want to be and how we show up versus how it actually is, I hold space for all of it. So whatever you are feeling, allow it to exist without judgment. And if you're listening and you're not a mother, well, you once had a mother, if uh, whether or not your mother is still alive. So I honor whatever relationship you have to motherhood, period. <sighs> Gosh, there's so much that I want to be able to share and to talk about in this episode. Uh, a huge majority of the work I do with my clients, the majority of my clients are women. The majority of those women are mothers. And as women, how we interact with this role of being mom can often feel messy and confusing and exhilarating and exciting and overwhelming and exhausting. And one of the challenges that I see so many women struggle with is there's like this, well, I guess with many challenges, but there's a very tactical piece of What do I do? How do I handle this moment? How do I manage a a tantruming toddler? How do I manage uh, the busyness of life? How do I manage a peaceful home versus having a chaotic and stressful home environment? So there's all of these like very, you know, tactical pieces. And then there's a very tangible piece of discipline and strategies around how to manage raising a person. And then there's like this whole other component of what do we do in our role as a mom separate from who I am as a woman? So I could talk on this for hours and I really want to keep this to about a a 25 minute episode. So I'm going to just touch on all of those and hopefully you find some comfort, some insight, some tools, some compassion for whatever it is that your experience is looking like right now. So let's just start at the beginning. I remember when I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, who, by the way, is 18 and a half years old and is graduating high school in three and a half weeks. (sighs) The ball of emotions I'm feeling as I even say those words out loud is the exact reason why I practice these tools and the exact reason why I teach these tools because I wanna honor for you, this is hard. And whatever emotions you're experiencing, whatever life stage you're going through, I just, again, I wanna hold space for you as I continue to hold space for myself, but I digress. Okay, back when I was pregnant with my daughter, I remember seeing a quote And it really stuck out with me. And the quote was, I want to say by the actor, John Leguizamo. I don't know that I'm saying his last name correctly. So I'm sorry for butchering the pronunciation. The quote said, 
the goal of parenting is to raise well-adjusted, secure adults. A happy childhood is a bonus. And that quote really, really stuck with me because I think we fail to recognize what it is that we're trying to do here. What we're doing is we're setting a foundation to raise a person who will one day be ready to go off into the world to be a contributing member of society in a healthy and integrated way. And yes, a happy childhood is a bonus. And that is actually the opposite of many parenting experiences. So if anything that I say throughout this episode triggers something inside of you that makes you feel sad, guilt, shame, embarrassment, overwhelm, understand the goal of what I'm sharing is to not make you feel bad. But if you do feel that tug at your heartstrings, just use that as an awareness to first and foremost practice self-compassion. There's no rule book for all of this. And so, so many of us are going off trial and error, doing either exactly what we had when we grew up or going the opposite of what we had growing up. Not many of us actually sit down and strategize and make a plan and check in with our co-parent and check in with ourselves to say, how's this going? Other than I just want to fix the problem. So that being said, it is an easy dynamic for many parents to want to have their kids be happy and want to create a happy childhood. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The challenge is that when that is the goal, what fails to exist often simultaneously are boundaries, are consequences, And allowing our child to feel unhappy or anxious or insecure. Uh, Hopefully you've listened to my episode with Julie Lithcott Hames, who is an amazing human but parenting expert who's written some uh, fantastic books, but has also has a, a blog and a community around parenting and One of the articles that she and I talked about in that episode was titled, okay, it's not your fault, or it's not your fault, okay, but it kind of is, something to the effect of that, in which she described her own parenting experience with her son, in which she tried to shield him from disappointment, from challenge, from heartache. Uh, And one of the examples she gave was by bringing food for him to eat at a friend's barbecue for fear that he wouldn't like the food that was there and to not cause a situation, wanted to alleviate the challenge by coming prepared. On the front end, that's a great strategy. On the back end and the long-term implication is that it doesn't give a lot of room for the child to experience how to adapt in diversity, how to be resilient through challenge. If we're always trying to protect, then we're not allowing them to build the muscle to connect with their tools, their strategies, their resources. And this is a challenge of parenting. So when we focus on raising an adult who is going to be ready to go off into the world secure and integrated and adjusted means that we've got to start planting that seed from a really young age. And as a mindful parent, as I've been practicing mindfulness as a parent for many years, what does this look like? Well, it can mean lots of things. At the very root of it, one of the questions that I ask parents Are you parenting to the child that you actually have? Or are you parenting to the child that you wish you had, hoped you had, or wanted to have? So I invite you right now in this moment to take a moment and pause and get curious around your own expectations of what it looks like for you to become a parent, to become a mom to become a father? What were your expectations of what your child was going to be like? 
What dreams and hopes and aspirations did you have for them? Now, there's nothing wrong with having dreams and hopes and aspirations. The key is to do so with non-attachment so that when our children are born into this world, that they are born with their own sovereign nature, meaning that we honor and respect and encourage and allow for them to be who they are supposed to be. And we parent from that place. We parent from the place of honoring their natural way of being in the world, their wiring, their intuition, their needs as separate, separate and different from your own. Well, in order to do that requires self-awareness for you to even recognize who you are with your own set of needs and emotions and expectations and separate from your parents. I mean, this is, you know, some deep work here. But to respect and honor the sovereign nature of your child looks like this in a tangible way. When my kids were pretty young, I recall doing my very best to take out of my vocabulary the statement of, you know what you should do is, because when I would tell my child, you know what you should do is, fill in the blank for whatever scenario, I presumed that I knew who they were internally. I presumed that just because I'm older, I knew better for them. And in doing so did not allow for the opportunity for their own self inquiry to decide, what do I wanna do in this moment? There was no curiosity, there was no learning curve, there was no opportunity for growth to have them explore themselves, their needs, their options and how to respond to a situation. So looking for moments early on for a child to have self-inquiry, to get to know themselves. And how do we as a parent facilitate that? Well, we give options for them to make their own decisions. So I read an article when my daughter was a baby and I wish I had kept it because I referred to it all the time. And the article had to do with how to prevent teens from succumbing to peer pressure. And this article impacted me greatly because having a teenager used to scare me, the idea of a peer group having more power and influence over my child than me felt daunting and overwhelming. It was my assumption that peer groups were inherently going to be inviting um, evil and destruction and chaos and fear, because at the time I led a very fear-based, anxious-based life and mindset. I have now since grown new muscles to not have that be my default. But I'll be honest, having a teenager used to really scare me. So this article spoke to me, and, and here's what it said. It said that kids who were given opportunities throughout their childhood to make decisions were given the message that you as the parent believed in them and trusted them in making a good decision. And so throughout childhood, to give them opportunities to practice decision-making, to have critical thinking, to do self-inquiry, to do insight into what their needs, how they felt, what uh, different options were, different outcomes and potential consequences or implications of decisions. Because here's the reality. A child who is compliant, who does exactly what you say, is easy and creates for a common peaceful home. And that's great because who doesn't want that? An implication, not the implication, but an implication of that is a child who's compliant simply has been raised being told what to do. Well, when it comes to a peer pressure situation, a kid who has been, what's the word I wanna say, conditioned perhaps, or in the habit of doing what others have told them to do, will likely succumb to peer pressure easier than kids who have been given more choices. Because the kid who is more compliant, who's in the habit of doing what others tell them, 
will likely want to appease their friends the same way they've learned to appease their parents' requests, but more importantly, do not have the muscle built to know how to go about making a decision on their own. And that just made so much sense to me. So from the time that my kids were really young, I looked for opportunities to provide them with the ability to make their own decisions. So rather than telling them, put on a jacket, it was an opportunity to say, hey, which would you prefer to wear, this red one or this blue one? Now, I manipulated the options because I wanted them to wear a jacket. See how there was no room there for really like no jacket not being an option. So you can present options that fulfill your needs as the parent, but giving your kids the ability to choose for themselves. It makes them feel empowered and it shows that you trust them in their decision. And when you can start small with these small little examples that don't have big implication, it gives room in the future for greater trust to be built. One of the ways this looks like in my house, my youngest daughter used to really care, and in fact still does, about her outfits and the clothes that she wore. And she would often say to me, Mommy, what should I wear? What should I wear today? And I was like a broken record. And I would say, well, Cami, this is a great opportunity for you to make a decision on your own. And she was like, okay, great, but what should I wear? She was maybe like seven, six, seven, eight, nine during this. And I would say the same thing. Well. This is a great opportunity for you to make a decision on your own. And she'd say, okay, but I don't know what to wear. Now, the easier solution would have been just for me to pick out an outfit. But I often look for those teaching moments. And in fact, she used to joke with me and she used to say, mommy, you use too much mindfulness in your parenting. And that was her accusation of me. And I'm like, great, tell that to your therapist one day. I'll pay for that. I'm, I'm fine with that accusation. It wasn't really an accusation. Well, maybe it was. Anyhow. So rather than just make the situation easier, I always looked for the teaching moments, which was harder in the moment for sure, but I believe had great um, outcomes in the long run. So I would say, well, Cami, let's talk about how we go about making a decision. How do we go about making a decision to decide what to wear today? Well, first of all, I bought you all your clothes. I quote approve of all your clothes. So, you know, whatever you choose, you know, as far as actual clothes, I, I'm going to approve of, but let's figure out how to make a decision. So for me, you know, wearing clothes was about the weather. So this was kind of before, you know, you could easily just pull up the phone and check the weather. I would say to her, well, let's go look out the window or let's go step outside to see what the weather is like. Can that can be one of the decision factors in helping you figure this out. And we would figure out what were the things she needed to know in order to make this decision. Again, harder in the moment, long-term payoff. So that level of teaching self-inquiry, self-insight to get your child to know themselves is huge. Another thing that has been a really impactful part of my own parenting that I've seen the proof is in the pudding. I've got two daughters, 18 and a half and 16. And let me tell you, I no longer fear having teenagers because I am so confident in the decision-making process of my daughters to make good decisions, not based on what I want, but based on who they are as humans, separate from me, separate from their father, as individuals, as having their own sovereign nature within their own values. One of the best ways to do that is to help them learn by having natural consequence. Natural consequence is one of the best teachers that you can give your kids because doing something just because I said so does not have much sticking ground for them to actually learn why it matters. And sometimes that means we need to let our kids maybe fail a little bit, be insecure, be unhappy, be anxious, be cold in, if it's cold outside and not have a jacket on. That's how they learn. That's how they grow. They don't learn by being shamed or judged into feeling a certain way. They certainly don't learn by being told what to do when you're role modeling something else, like yelling at them to calm down while you're screaming. They learn through natural consequence. They learn through understanding their mistakes, which means we've got to give them room to make those mistakes and then have the opportunity 
to talk about it and help understand what they learned from that and how they can do it different in the future. And I know I've talked about this in previous episodes. I'm not going to go deeply into it, but one of the best ways that we did that with my kids was what we called the consequence book, which was helping them have their own accountability. So I I invite you to listen to some earlier episodes and I don't right off the bat know which episode it is, but I'll put it into the show notes where I go deeper into the consequence book. But it's a, it's a way for kids to have accountability over their actions. It removes you as the all-being, all-knowing, powerful parent who is in control of their life. It rather puts you in the role of guide and, and being in support in which you're on the same team rooting for your kid versus feeling adversarial that they have to just do as you say. The Consequence book teaches your kids to understand what they did wrong to know what they could have done differently, to help them understand that their actions have natural consequence. And here's the radical part in which they actually choose their own consequence should they break the rules again. You have to approve of the consequence, but it really teaches accountability and this is huge. So I know I'm going into a lot of foundation of parenting tools, but you know, I really wanna kind of shift some of these foundations and also as a reminder that teaching self-inquiry, trusting their sovereign nature, having natural consequence, these can be done at any age. I did this as foundational when my kids were young, but I've worked with parents who are doing these tools with adult children. And even Julie Lithcott Hames talks about repatterning your patterns as an adult parent of adult children. It's never too late to try on a new way of being, a new way of communication, a new way of showing up. There's nothing wrong with authentically saying to your kids, you know what? I've realized I've learned some things that this isn't working. I'm working on something new. Here's how I want to practice showing up in this relationship for both of us. One of the ways that I I really want to honor a way to do that is to be authentic with your kids around your own emotions. This is a tricky, stucky sticky space for many parents because they feel like they need to hold it all together. They need to role model, stoic, put together, non-reactive, non-emotional beings. And that's not realistic. We are emotional beings. We feel. The key is to not have the emotions take over, but to know what to do with them when they arise. And more importantly, to authentically give them room to exist. So just last night, I had a moment in which I was feeling my emotions very deeply. And I could have easily sucked it up and dealt with them and put on a brave face in front of my daughter. But instead, I named them. I allowed myself to cry. I I named what I was feeling. I put it into context. And I was very, very clear in my intention of sharing my emotions. My intention for sharing my emotions was to show up authentically to my daughter, but also with the intention. I'm not sharing what I'm experiencing to be a burden for you to carry. My emotions are not your work. This is my work. And I was naming it from a place of owning. This is where I'm at right now. This is what I'm going through. This is what I'm feeling. And thank you for holding space for me. Thank you for having compassion. And my emotions are not your burden. So it's a fine line, right, between parent and child. And it can be a sticky zone. And the key is in the communication. Because part of what I did there is as my child is getting ready to embark out into the world as she's preparing to leave for college, which is, by the way, what my deep emotions was about, was the very real and messy, authentic feelings of how to shift my own mothering role to an adult child in which she has divorced parents, having to navigate sharing space and sharing milestones, having to navigate the the sense of loss of the childhood over the 18 years that's gone by in the blink of an eye. 
and how to shift those roles for me and to name where I'm at with, again, it's not her burden, but I also want to be real because one day, God willing, she will be a mother. And I'm also not sharing my emotions as a way to take away from whatever she's feeling. It's creating the space for us both to express where we're at. And I've done this throughout my kids' childhoods in where I have, I believe by holding space and naming my emotions unapologetically and with compassion has given permission for them to express theirs, right? That it's, we allow ourselves to cry when we're sad because that's a real and healthy response. That when we want to speak our truth, we have permission to speak our truth even and especially when that might disappoint somebody, but how to balance authenticity with people pleasing and to know when to speak your truth and then and the essence and the abilities in which we can have eloquence in doing so. Like these are all the teaching moments. And so when we can honor ourselves as humans, when we can honor ourselves as mothers and women in the same space, as we're parenting, I believe that we're giving a huge gift to our children. So there's so much more I can say about this. And this is not just a neatly packaged, you know, set of tools to just say, okay, now go do this. This is really, really deep work. And it starts with us as women, as mothers, as parents, looking within to say, who am I? Who am I separate as a uh, myself as a woman, as a mother, as a friend, as a partner, who whatever our roles are, and authentically holding space for that. Because when we can do that for ourselves, we are more able to do that for our children. So I, I literally could have spoken for three hours here. So I'll end here. I will talk more about this, but I do hope that this gave you some allowance for considering your own ways of showing up as a mom remembering what it means to be present is to you know fully be here now not wishing for the hard moments to pass because the quick moments pass or the, the easy moments pass just as quickly to honor whatever is arising to be able to respond and not react to hold on to that sovereign nature all of these tools are practices, and I hope that this has given you a, a few minutes to have some self-inquiry, have some self-compassion, to begin to see where the, the challenges are that you want to work on. And um, I, I've got lots of tools at your disposal. So if this resonates, if this is something you're wanting more support around, I, I'm happy to be here as a guide. Uh, there's a link in the show notes to some offerings that I have. And I wish you peaceful moments. I wish you present moments. I wish you compassion during the chaotic moments. I wish you uh, the permission to feel all that you feel on this parenting journey. As John Kabat-Zinn would say, it is full catastrophe living which means we experience it all. It's all part of the human experience. So thank you for tuning in today and for listening and for giving me a space to be able to share my thoughts on my own parenting journey as I am about to embark on what that next chapter looks like that I am holding space for with a huge range of emotions, excitement, joy, sadness, um, happiness, pride. Oh my gosh. It, it is a full ball of, of emotions all at the same time. And that, that's what it means to be human. So here's to your humanness and uh, take care. Be well. To continue your journey forward, find Jory Rose on Facebook and Instagram to become part of her growing community. You can also gain access to her meditations, books, online classes, or to sign up for an upcoming retreat, visit her at joryrose.com. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot -E -E com.